Hi, my name is Mark Lanza. I'm president of the Motion Picture Sound Editors. Welcome to our Sound Advice event for October 15th, 2020. We have a lot more Sound Advice events coming up, so please check your email and the MPSE Facebook page for details. It is election time for the, our board of directors. If you've been a member for two or more years, you're eligible to run for a board of directors seat and help us guide the Motion Picture Sound Editors. Please contact our office to throw your hat in the ring if you are interested. The MPSC is trying to keep our community strong and connected during these times, as well as uh, strengthen our skill set for when things open up. Today's session is informative because it's a current and emerging technology that will freak you out a little bit, uh, and rightfully so. Uh, big thank you to Alex, Dimitro, and Grant for tonight or today's session. They are co-founders of a company called Respeecher. You've already heard their work in a number of large projects and didn't even know it, and they can't say what they are. Neither can I. So please take it away, guys. Hi, all. Nice, nice meeting you all here. So I'll start with screen sharing. I'm Alex. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Respeecher. And today I'm with you with technical co-founders of Respeecher, Dmitro and Grant. They will actually do the most of talking and demoing after this short intro from me. So we'll start with the demo video. Please have a listen. Hi, I'm Grant, a co-founder of Respeecher. In a minute, you'll see a video of Daniel Cohn, the head of Lyft Labs. And then you'll see a video where I speak in Daniel's voice. You are listening to the Ideas Elevated podcast of Comcast NBC Universal Lyft Labs. The system captures the idiosyncrasies of how I say something each time I say it. I can say the same thing many times, the same thing many times, the same thing many times. And each time the recording will be correspondingly different. So Respeecher applies AI to let one voice sound exactly like another voice. Uh, we are a deep tech startup company. We went through Techstars, Comcast, and BCU startup acceleration program. And now we are heads down making our tech better and bringing more uh, creative tools to more content creators. So far, we've worked on documentary and feature films. And uh, the biggest project, as Mark mentioned, was one of the very anticipated Hollywood blockbusters of 2019. Uh, I will start with comparison between text-to-speech and speech-to-speech. -speech. So there are two main approaches to synthesize a voice. Uh, the difference is basically an input. So text-to-speech generates a voice from text. There are a lot of text-to-speech companies, and some of them are doing personalized text-to-speech, where you can train a system on a particular voice you'd like to use and then generate some new lines in that voice. What's cool about text-to-speech that it is easy to use because there are no humans in the loop and you just input text and let AI generate the voice track. But there are some limitations to this kind of approach. So you have very limited control over the emotional content and you can't make it say stuff exactly as you want it to be said. Some text-to-speech systems give you some control, like you can make it sound calm or excited, but we found out that creators look for more flexibility in their work. Also being tied to the language model, text-to-speech struggles with unusual words. Foreign languages or some nuances like, uh, like humming or giggling. And regarding the data, to make a good text-to-speech model, it's often required to have a lot of training material and hours of good recordings. Our approach is speech-to-speech. -speech. It uses human voice as an input and changes the voice of, to, to the desired one. And the main limitation compared to text-to-speech, we keep source voice actors in the loop as they have actually delivered these new lines. But the following speech-to-speech uh, -speech features makes it more usable to, to, to use in high-quality content. Uh, like sound quality and naturalness, speech-to-speech -speech doesn't sound robotic as it transfers all the emotions from real human. It also gives creative control. Speech-to-speech uh, -speech allows to have control over emotional content and you can make voice actor deliver the exact performance you want and the system will preserve the acting and will just change the voice itself. Also, uh, our approach is language agnostic, and any unknown words, abbreviations, unusual names, 
all, all other sounds that, that produces our vocal apparatus could be changed to the desired voice. Uh, there are five steps how our system works. So the first one is to get permission from voice ta talent. And we always require that our clients get permission from the target voice before starting a project. The second uh, step is collect the target voice data. And we ask for high quality one hour, 60 minutes recording of the target voice. It can be some existing stuff uh, or some new recording, but it should be clean, no other voices, no background noises, ideally no reverb. Then we need to collect source voice data. And we just need one hour sample from the source actor's voice. And both for target and source voices, we do not require a specific script. Then we do our magic. So we feed this data set into our system and it learns how to change the source actor's voice to the target voice. And after training, we can move to the next step, doing the inference. This is a simple infographic of the process. So Danielle from the video we showed you would be a target voice and Grant would be a source voice. And we took Danielle's recordings, Grant recordings, did the training, and then Grant recorded new lines and we converted that to Daniel voice. And also on this, this, this demo, you can see that uh, male to female and female to male voice conversion is not a problem for technology like ours. We shouldn't be speaking too much here about applications for content creators, because I presume audience have, have quite good understanding how they can use voice cloning technology. What we found out that our tech could be used not only in post-production, but actually on all stages of creation process. So in pre-production, you can try how the piece would sound in different voices. And in production and post-production, it's, it's like CGI for voice. So you can use it in ADR. You can use it for getting the voices you cannot get to the studio at the moment, for kids' voices that changed after kids grew, uh, for voices from the past. So we also did resurrection, that kind of stuff. Uh, we need to talk here about ethics, uh, as while we are using this technology to revolutionize movies, um, video games, other types of creative projects, such technology can also fool people into thinking that someone said something they actually didn't. And some ethical questions about synthetic speech are easy, but others are hard. And we don't just rely on our gut to tell us what is right. We built a set of principles that guides us through the decision making process. So this feature does not allow any deceptive uses of our technology. Uh, Respecial doesn't use voices without permission when that could impact privacy of the subject or their ability to make a living. In practice, this mean, means that we'll never use the voice of a private person or an actor without permission, but we do allow some non-deceptive uses of technology uh, when we need to recreate voices of historical figures, such as Winston Churchill. Uh, it's actually all well and good to have strong principles, but the next question is how we can ensure that they are not violated. And for that, we have following approach. Respeacher does not provide any public API for creating or using voices, uh, unlike actually many of text-to-speech companies. We work directly with clients we trust, and we work with studios mostly. Uh, we always require written consent from voice owners, and we uh, work in projects that meet our strict standards. Uh, also, we are developing a watermarking technology that allows us to easily tell respeacher generated content from other content. Uh, but of course, we are not the only ones working in this space. Uh, and as leaders in terms of sound quality and naturalness of, of the speech, we feel responsibility to mitigate the impact of unethical use of this technology by whoever produces it. Uh, we are just getting started in this area, but our goals are following. We need to educate the public about the capabilities of synthetic speech technology. We actually did a couple of projects uh, that were directed specifically for education. Uh, we are going to develop 
automatic detection algorithms and help improving other algorithms that can detect synthetic speech, even if it's not been watermarked by us. And uh, we are going to work with gatekeepers of content, such as Facebook and YouTube, to limit the harm of voice cloning by bad actors. Uh, and the way we can do that through prominent labeling of all synthetic content and banning of particularly unethical content. Uh, here, my part is over and I'll give the word to Grant, but just before that, I want to announce that we are launching quite soon a better version of Voice Marketplace. And we believe that this tool would be very usable when you need to change voice but you don't need the particular voice. So what we did, we created a number of voices. We generated a number of voices. And we want to open a tool for content creators where you can just log in there, provide a sample of your voice. We, we train the system on your voice as a source. And after that, you can log in into the system anytime you want and change your voice to the number of voices we have there. We'll start with a dozen of voices. And uh, I'll send a link to this chat uh, where you can subscribe for that because we are looking for beta testers uh, for, for this cool system. I believe that would be of help to you for crowd, for Vola, or for just voiceover in some non-crucial characters where speaker identity should. Uh, thank you, Alex. Yeah, so my name is Grant. I'm a technical co-founder of Respeacher, as Alex said, and I'll be telling you a little bit more about how the system works uh, for you guys and a little bit about how it works behind the scenes, like kind of the technology behind it. So first of all, I want to say something about what um, Respeacher is, uh, is, is not, sort of to distinguish it from some of the other uh, technologies uh, that are out there um, that you may be familiar with. Um, so one technology is voice morphing. Um, so there's a lot of voice morphers you can download for your phone or on a, on a PC, and they can generate kind of funny effects for a voice. So it might make you sound like you're on helium, for instance. And, um, or it can make you sound like a, a monster or something. Um, and these, these uh, technologies use uh, some kind of digital signal processing filters that, that does take sound on the input, processes it in some way, and then produces something on the output. Um, and they can be very uh, fast and um, uh, they can produce some like interesting effects. But um, the effects that they produce tend to be not very natural. So uh, they can't, for instance, change, they can't even, for instance, convincingly change a male voice to a female voice or vice versa. There are, there are voice morphers that, that's, that try to do this, um, but it doesn't sound that realistic. And they certainly can't, um, allow you to sound like a particular person. Like they couldn't make me sound like Daniel Kahn. Um, you know, uh, sort of obviously they can't even make me sound like any woman. Um, so that's one thing to distinguish um, our technology from. The other thing as Alex already ex was explaining is text to speech. So text to speech is synthetic speech. It can make you sound like, a, it can make the voice of a particular person um, but it doesn't use speech on the input. And because of that, it has all the disadvantages um, that Alex talked about in terms of not being able to have a particular performance. Uh, um, it's just the performance you want, not being able to deal with um, words that it doesn't know or something or sort of sounds that aren't linguistic sounds. So sometimes people ask us, well, why don't you just um, use like an automatic speech recognition engine followed by text-to-speech, or they think that that's what we do. But that's not at all how our technology works. It just sort of directly processes audio, and there's no stage in the processing at which there's a textual representation of the audio. Um, and if there were such a stage, we would really lose a lot of the character of the performance, and we would start to have these problems with um, words that the system doesn't know, or the system just making mistakes, because even the best uh, speech recognition systems make mistakes. So that brings me to the next um, point, which is, well, what is respeecher if it's not uh, speech morphing and it's not text to speech? Well, it's an AI driven speech processor. Um, so what that means is that like, like text to speech, it creates a, an audio signal from scratch. Um, 
it doesn't just process some existing audio. Basically, it takes the exist, it takes the source speech, it processes it, and it transforms it into an abstract high-level code that runs at a much lower frequency than an audio signal. Like an audio signal might be like 48 kilohertz, um, and our code might be at most like 100 hertz or even less. And this code uh, basically encodes the uh, sort of the some some abstract information that corresponds to like the physical um, muscle movements that would be necessary uh, to produce speech or the acoustic um, uh, parameters that could actually produce a kind of speech. And then by transforming this code, um, at, which which is much more abstract than something like an audio signal, we're able to um, actually transform the speech of one particular person to that of another particular person. Um, now, it's only actually very recently that uh, it was possible to take a high level code like this and transform it to audio that sounded at all realistic. So basically, there is a model called WaveNet that was released in 2016 um, and some other models that came out around the same time that basically for the first time they demonstrated that computers could produce a very natural synthetic speech and it was first used for text to speech and before that time, text-to-speech sounded really obviously synthetic, as you've probably heard, um, this, these older text-to-speech systems. But after that, it's, well, like now, it's not like text-to-speech systems are perfect. Um, you can still tell that you know, maybe the intonation and the prosody of the speech is not perfectly natural. But the, the quality of the, sort of the audio quality has gotten to a point where it is close to perfect now. And it's because of these new techniques like WaveNet, they're all based on um, machine learning and, uh, and uh, deep neural networks in particular. Um, so yeah, let me talk a little bit about deep learning or AI and how that's relevant to this whole problem. So the, the basic point is that the dependency of the waveform on this abstract signal um, and e even figuring out what kind of abstract signal would be a suitable abstract signal to represent speech it's like a very complicated um, problem that we don't, no, nobody understands actually. Like even, even though we built this system, we, we build systems now that, that use these abstract codes and can create waveforms based on them. We don't understand exactly what's going on inside these codes. Instead, what we do is we use machine learning and we supply a bunch of data to the system. We design a system that can learn uh, to find these codes and to decode these codes using just uh, data, just audio. The way these systems work is they, they use what are called deep neural networks, which is a, a type of machine learning that's become, um, that just like produced really amazing results in, in a wide variety of areas, not only in audio production, but you know, in um, uh, machine translation, in uh, image recognition, self-driving cars, um, sort of you name it, it's, it's kind of revolutionizing a lot of areas. One thing, I, I, uh, one thing that people often ask us uh, about is sort of the data requirements of our system. So because our system is trained on um, audio, it, it requires um, kind of more audio than you might expect um, to learn to do this transformation. And in fact, deep learning is sort of notorious for requiring a huge amount of data. So if you want to train a network, that can recognize cats, you know, you might have to give it like a million images um, with, with cats or no cats before it does a good job, um, which is very different from, of course, like a human, you might be able to give a human just like uh, one image of a cat and then the, the person could recognize cats from then on. Um, so how do we deal with this, um, this requirement for a lot of data? Well, yeah, so as Alex said, first of all, um, voice conversion requires less data than text-to-speech does simply because the uh, mapping that the um, network has to learn is only in the audio space, and it doesn't have to learn anything about the underlying language. Um, so that's one advantage we have kind of coming out of the gate. Um, but we still require a, a lot of data. Um, we, we usually ask currently for best results. We ask people to give us one hour of the source speaker and one hour of the target speaker. Um, 
But what we can do that, that, um, that we already do some and that we're working on doing more that reduces the data requirements is that we don't only train on the data that uh, the client gives us of that source speaker and that target speaker. We also train on like a lot of other data from other speakers. And so even though the network as a whole might need, maybe it needs hundreds of hours to do to learn a really good um, mapping, um, no client has to provide us with hundreds of hours of data because we use a lot of data from other speakers and just combine it with a relatively small amount of data um, from the client. Um, and so what we found is that um, to work, to get good results from the system in general, and especially with small amounts of data, um, it's really important to have consistent recording conditions in those data sets. So like however much data, uh, it's much better to have data from like one recording in one studio than to try to cobble together uh, data from like a bunch of different YouTube videos or something. Um, it's also good to have really high quality recordings and ideally no reverb because reverb basically just sort of complicates the signal. And then to learn that abstract code, the model basically has to learn to undo the reverb, which makes it harder for it. Um, and yeah, when we do have high quality data and, uh, and hopefully in the future, even if we don't have high quality data, um, we can try to use less data than one hour of the source and the target. We can even try to use no data from the source at all. Um, currently that works to some extent in our system, but there's a quality compromise and we can use less data from the target. Um, and, and basically the way that we do that is we just, again, we train the model on like a lot of other data and then maybe we train it a little bit on the, uh, especially giving it this small amount of new data which is a technique sometimes called adaptation or transfer learning. Um, so that, that's from actually from the, the most important thing. If, if there's one thing you remember from this talk, it's, it's about the, that the quality of the, of the conversion depends tremendously on the quality of the data. And um, uh, so that, that's like the most important thing that's gonna lead to customer success is having like really great data um, from the source and the target speaker. Oh, and then the other thing is um, you can have great data from the source speaker that we use for training, but then if you try to give us lines to convert that are recorded in a different, um, maybe a, like a completely different uh, circumstance, like for instance, imagine um, an actor uh, records a bunch of data for a training set in a studio, and then uh, because of COVID, the actor has to, uh, record some lines to convert from their kitchen. Um, so in a situation like that, that can lead to a compromise of quality because there's this um, divergence between the, um, the situation in which the training data was recorded and the situation in which the lines to convert were recorded. So we really try as much as possible to avoid that. Uh, we realize that it's often difficult for clients because uh, you know they can't always maintain perfect consistency between uh, recording conditions in all cases. So that's something we're working on, uh, trying to reduce the sensitivity of our model to this issue. But um, it must be said that the, the current model is pretty sensitive to this issue. So that's all about how the model gets trained and created in the first place. Once the model is created, then the next step is to actually do conversions to convert new uh, audio material into the target voice. So how does that work? Well, there's actually um, two different ways that we can do this. So there's kind of what we call the traditional respeech or conversion workflow, uh, which is how we worked mostly up, up, up until quite recently. Um, and then there's a newer approach that I'll discuss a bit later. So in the uh, traditional respeech or conversion workflow, first we go through this whole training flow that I've just talked about a bit and that Alex talked about. Um, uh, where we get the source and the target data, we train the model. Um, and then when we need to convert new stuff, um, typically the client would just send us audio files of, uh, of the data that they want to convert. And um, we would ask for many takes of each line. And the reason for that is that the model is not perfectly robust. Um, that, that means that if you record one 
if you record one take of a line, sometimes the take will sound cool in the source voice, but the conversion will have a problem, like the model will make a pronunciation error that the source voice didn't make. Um, and so if a client needs um, to know that when they get the conversion back, that the conversion is going to be fine, then we actually need to, we actually tell them, well, why don't you send us like 10 takes of each line? So in case some of them are no good, we can pick one that, that is good. And that's obviously, um, you know, that's obviously like an inconvenience uh, on the client side. Um, so then what we would do is we would convert, uh, we would convert all these lines, we would check the quality of them, uh, listen to them. There's no automated way of doing this. And if necessary, sometimes we'll even take um, different parts uh, from different lines. Like we might take the first half of one sample and the last half of another sample and paste them together because maybe the first half of one sample sounded good and the last half of another sample sounded good in the conversion. Um, and, and so we just want to combine those two things. So that, that's, that's kind of the, and then we would send the conversions back to the client. Or sometimes we just send the raw conversions to the client and the client does this and the client will have to like listen to a whole bunch of conversions or maybe paste conversions together if they're going to do that. Um, so that's the traditional way we work. It's labor intensive, but there is one advantage of this traditional way, which is that we get to hear all of the conversions, see what they're like, and we can sort of iterate on um, sometimes making enhancements to the model or sometimes there's sort of tweaks that we can do to our conversion process. We can adjust some of the parameters and make the conversion go a little bit better than it would just using like the default settings of the model. And um, so a newer way that we have of working um, uh, is in a lot of ways more, more convenient um, for both uh, the client and for respeacher. And the way that works is that we have a, a web app that we call TakeBaker and we load the model into this web app and then the client um, can uh, create recordings inside this web app, either using the microphone or uploading pre-created recordings and immediately get back some sort of conversion. The client can try multiple voices or multiple models kind of at the same time. The client can kind of iterate on stuff like a lot more quickly than they could if they were sending us WAV files and waiting for us to, you know, it might take us like a day to send back the WAV file, even though the conversions themselves go pretty quick. I mean, somebody on Respeacher side has to like run the program to do the conversion and mail it back. And it's going to take at least a few hours with the old workflow. Um, but with TakeBaker, it can be more or less instantaneous. Um, one issue is that there is some um, compromise in quality, at least if you want really fast conversions, because our highest quality rendering engines takes like some are kind of long to run. Like they take several minutes maybe for to convert a short amount of um, of audio. Um, and for that reason, uh, what we're kind of experimenting with is trying different, um, different sorts of different rendering engines um, that have a different kind of speed quality trade offs. And so the idea would be that you can um, just almost instantaneously get back a conversion in kind of a draft, what we call a draft quality, it's like a lower quality, but it still allows you to see if, if the result is kind of what you want. And then waiting longer, you can get a higher quality conversion. So that's kind of our, how, we're, how we're addressing this issue now. Um, so I, what I'd like to do now is to give you uh, like a short uh, demonstration of how, um, of, how of how this Take Baker software works. Uh, so this, this is the software. We've got like four columns here. The first column corresponds to like an original recording that we're going to make. And then these other columns correspond to uh, conversions that have been done. So I can, I can play you one that I've, uh, that I've done already. I think I'm not sharing audio actually in the, uh, I'm not sure. I don't think the audio from my computer is going directly through Zoom. So the audio quality is going to suffer here a little bit, but um, you'll get a general idea of how the system works. Um, We'll play an original recording. Testing this thing here. All right. And then here is a, this is Danielle, who you saw from the video. Testing this thing here. Um, 
And this is uh, Dima uh, Dimitro. That's my co-founder, who you'll meet um, in, in a minute. I guess he's waving. Um, Testing this thing here. Uh, you can hear there's like some kind of background noise in, in, in there. And that's kind of like a typical artifact that we have um, that um, in the highest quality conversions we, we wouldn't have. And then here's the, the voice of, uh, of Tom Hanks. Testing this thing here. Uh, and, and just to show you, I can, um, I, I'll, I'm just gonna record a little something uh, and, and do a live conversion. Um, so let, let's see. Um, hello, MS, uh, hello, motion picture sound editors. Um, so you can hear the original recording is loaded. Hello, MS, uh, hello, motion picture sound editors. And I hope it converted okay. Hello, MS, them. Hello, motion picture sound editors. So yeah, you can hear it's the Danielle voice. Um, oh, okay, here's Dima. Hello, MS, them. Hello, motion picture sound editors. Let's listen to the Hanks voice. Hello, MS, them. Hello, motion picture sound editors. And that's Hanks. So yeah, this is kind of obviously sort of a beta system, and the quality isn't as good as um, you can get with our full with in, in the best case, and also obviously. The conversion is kind of annoyingly slow, um, but it gives you a sense of um, where we're headed. And in the future, we'll have better quality and faster conversions. And uh, instead of just having like three voices preloaded, you'll be able to choose which voices you you, you want to use uh, on the fly. Maybe either voices that we make specially for you um, based on your target training data or voices from this uh, the voice marketplace that Alex was um, describing. In fact, that's another reason we're really excited about Take Baker is that um, with Voice Marketplace, where we just have like a bunch of pre-created voices that anybody can use, it's not really very feasible to work in the traditional way that we used to work um, because it's not very scalable. You know, we need uh, with Voice Marketplace, we're going to have a lot of customers um, and who want to get results really quickly um, and. Uh, it really makes sense for that use case to use something like um, Take Baker. So, uh, I guess, yeah, I'm, I'm Dimitri, another technical co founder of Risk Feature. So, yeah, I guess it's not going to take long. What I was going to show you is um, like a demonstration of what we can achieve with a sort of traditional approach where we, you know, where everything is in this controlled environment and we, like take a bunch of time to perform those conversions to put the final line together to pick the best takes and stuff like that. So here's an, uh, so here's an example of Tom Hanks and uh, Lion, and hopefully you can hear really well. What is the Motion Picture Sound Editors, NPSE? Founded in 1953, the NPSE is an organization dedicated to improving the recognition of its members by educating the public and the rest of the filmmaking community as to the artistic merit of sound editing. The efforts of our talented and hardworking members can be heard every hour of the day all over the world. What is All right, so um, so this was kind of put together. I, I guess like one thing, one interesting thing in this particular sample is that you can see there's like a bunch of background noise. And that one is uh, due to quantization because our network, well, this particular network predicts 8-bit outputs because I guess we were like in a little bit of a hurry for this demo and didn't have time to train a like a 16-bit one, which which requires an additional stage of training. But sort of the quality otherwise is is very similar. It's just that it doesn't have as much of, of background quantization noise. So this is a 10-bit model. Um, yeah, and I guess in practice, there's I can also show you a bunch of um, a bunch of other takes, which sometimes make pronunciation mistakes. And in practice, we just like grant. So, so that tanks demo was converted from grant. And in practice, we uh, in practice we sort of go to um, take uh, ask the source speaker, which is grant in this case, to record a whole bunch of takes. And we kind of go over those takes and uh, try to pick 
the samples that turned out great, uh, better than others that that, we, that have the right performance, both the right performance and um, and the proper quality don't, don't have as many pronunciation mistakes. So here's just like a bunch of samples, random random selection of samples that sometimes have some pronunciation mistakes. What is the motion picture sound editors in BSC? This one is like maybe a too low. I wouldn't pick that one. The MPSE is an organization dedicated to improving the recognition of its members. It says an organization instead of an organization. Like educating the public and the rest of the filmmaking community. So yeah, stuff like founded that. Founded in 1953. Maybe it's something more crazy down here. Let's see. The efforts are talented and hardworking members the MPSC is an organization dedicated to improving the recognition of its members. Anyway, yeah, so that's that. I mean, I guess you, you've spotted a bunch of pronunciation mistakes and stuff like that. So we, we just try to, like in practice, we try to go over these takes and put together and find find the best performances and the best um, accuracy. But that's, uh, yeah, that's pretty much all uh, I wanted to say. I guess there will be some questions and we can get back to some of this stuff. So yeah, thanks. Yeah, so if anybody uh, watching has some questions, uh, now's the time. Unmute and please, uh, please ask away. And I see there are some questions in the uh, comments about uh, uh, permissions from SAG-AFTRA and things like that. Um, I don't know what the legal ramifications of any of this are. I know you've had to deal with some of that. Um, probably dealing with estates from people who have passed, and and I'm sure there's a lot of that to come. From you know, actor, something happens in the middle of a movie, or maybe it's a sequel and they're not around. So, what are the legal ramifications that have to be overcome? I mean, in our case, when we always require permission, we we don't expect a big pushback from SAG-AFTRA, and especially if source actor is also the member of that, that guild. We actually uh, are like in the very beginning of adoption curve of that technology because it's quite new and it just has been introduced to the market. So we need to go through this process of adoption and understanding of all um, players in the field of how it works. But what we do at Respeacher, we work on building relationship with uh, SAG, with CAA, UTA, um, WME, uh, CMG, all these kind of folks that either represent or protect uh, members. So, so we we want everybody to be comfortable there. We understand that at some point it could happen, and we just just want to build the right framework there. And one of the ways of building the right the right way of using the technology so everyone is happy is actually introducing more projects using our technology so people can see that it's used in this particular good way where uh, we got permission, where an actor was compensated uh, somehow, so all, all that kind of stuff. Hey guys, I have a question regarding language. Um, does the source and target have to be the same language if I wanted to differ languages or how would that work? Yeah, so um, I guess there's a, a number of different things that can go on with the with the language. Um, so, like one sort of uh, situation might be that you want to dub a movie using the voice of the original source actor. So you have like Tom Hanks, and then you've got uh, the original the original actor. So you have like Tom Hanks made a movie, and you want to uh, dub that into Spanish or something. And um, so you could hire some some Spanish actor. Um, so it's possible in that case to uh, change uh, the the voice of the Spanish actor into the voice of Tom Hanks, but the current system um, doesn't do very much accent changing. So the result is going to be that um, you'll end up with Tom Hanks kind of Tom Hanks voice, um, but he'll be uh, he'll be speaking Spanish. But there, there'll be sort of like a mix of accents. So he'll he'll he can speak Spanish, um, but he'll have some sort of um, an American accent because the system never heard like the legitimate uh, Spanish sounds from Tom Hanks. Um, so there's, yeah, so we're, there's like, and that, that's just one sort of cross-lingual case. 
there's actually like a number of permutations of what you might want to do in a cross-lingual, a sort of cross-lingual. And basically all of them, we have sort of the same answer right now, which is that it kind of works. Um, in some cases, the effect might be what you want, um, but it doesn't, um, you know, but there, there's some, some, it might not do exactly what you want. Like the person's probably, if, they, if the person, it's not going to make someone who never spoke Spanish speak Spanish like flawlessly. And also when we talk about accents, we can think about using this kind of, uh, of problem we have in our system that it, it, it produces accent from a target person for good. So we, we are exploring options to create accentifier. So in, in movies where you need to create like Ukrainian or Russian accent, um, when we listen to that, when Americans are trying to, to say something in Russian for uh, native Russian speakers or for native Ukrainian speakers who usually can understand Russian very good, they, they hear that it's not natural. But when we try it with our system, we, we hear quite natural American accent if you make Tom Hanks say something in Ukrainian and, and, or Russian. Uh, but yeah, we, we still explore that stuff, but it has some, some very promising directions to, to give an accentifier to Yeah, I was just going to add, like, quickly add regarding the, like, if the accents are really similar, like, well, not really similar, but if the accents are kind of close to different accents of the same language, at least, uh, we'd notice that with, with, the, with the newest model, like the triad converting, like the, the guy's a native kind of, uh, he's got an accent that's a mixture of American and British, which is pretty unusual, but that's, that's what it was. And so if you give an, like an, a native American speaker to the input, it kind of seems to re remove the accent, so the, the target sounds like an American, uh, like an American American native. Uh, so, but but that's only for the case when when, when those are close. If there's a as ground explained, if there's a far apart, it becomes more challenging. Um, I see Jeremy Gordon asked a question: uh, a free speecher. Uh, oh. Uh, is it possible to correct an individual word or phrase that is not working out well rather than re-recording the entire piece? Yeah, I, I guess, well, like, it is not possible right now. We can, you can record like a smaller phrase or something, but what we're kind of, um, like one interesting thing that we're working on is uh, when you try to, when, when you have an like auxiliary text input, so usually you just give it, you know, a speech on the input you're recording as Grant did in the take baker, and then get a conversion on the output. But then potentially if there's like a problem with a certain word, we want to add an ability to kind of type type the word in and uh, kind of correct, help it a little bit to 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 uh, to figure out what to say. But that's sort of that's kind of an experimental thing. It's, it's, uh, it's not quite ready yet, but we're kind of uh, hopefully we'll see it pretty soon. And I see you uh, answered Pepe. Uh, he said, uh, is it ready to go for the new year? And you guys answered in the chat. Uh, yes, absolutely. It is, uh, it is all ready to go. We've already used it, or not we, you have already used it in, uh, in several projects. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we need some time for training the model, but once the model is trained, it's quite fast to produce new samples. And the training time, it actually depends on the data and on the particular model we use, but it, it, it could be like two, three weeks, not, not, not more. In some projects, though, uh, clients required us to apply some, some additional techniques. Uh, some of them might be in R&D phase. And it, it would require us to train multiple models and some R&D-ish models that we haven't tested so it can make the, the overall duration of the project a bit longer. I see one question here. Is there a curve of diminishing returns when it comes to target, target data, set data size? Set size? Yeah, like, uh, do, you, do you find, uh, sorry, that's, that's my question. Uh, okay. if, uh, if you need, like, a, like what is the, uh, prescribed uh, data set size for a target or like do you find like inputting more and more data tends to not really make the model like hash out uh, like do you is there a curve where throwing more data into the the AI model doesn't really return a greater outcome or 
or tighter return? Uh, you know, yeah, yeah, that's a great, great question. Um, basi basically, what we find is, and, and I think what people in a lot of areas of deep learning uh, find, is that more data pretty much always helps. But the way it helps is that like, if you sort of double the amount of data, then you get kind of like a certain amount of, of, um, of increase. So, um, so like if you, um, so it becomes unmanageable pretty quickly, right? So if you have like, like one hour is pretty good, well, two hours might be better, four hours might be better, you know, but, but it's like, um, uh, we, we never have clients who have that much data. Um, so we never even encountered the case, but, um, but yeah, if we had like thousands of hours, um, it could probably be better. But um, that's not a situation that. that so uh, yeah, so really getting counter. getting data in, in the first place, I guess, is like the big like quality data. I guess would be the big big thing. I guess so. Like voiceover, I guess probably would be the best target source. Would you, would you say like voiceover recording would be? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So like um, some of our best stuff has been from from voiceover recordings or from audiobooks. Um, the, the one kind of disadvantage of some of that stuff is that it doesn't have um, the huge emotional range. And so if we're doing like a um, uh, cartoon or something, um, or even just, uh, even just like a movie that has like a big emotional range from the actors and all we have is like audiobook data and then they're supposed to be like super emotional and like screaming or crying or something, uh, it can be a bit of a problem that we don't see those emotions in the training data. Um, but yeah, the ideal thing would be something where it's like has has an emotional range that matches what we want to convert, and that's also like really well recorded in consistent conditions. And in that case, um, actually, if we just have an hour of recording, it's kind of like plenty to do like a really uh, great job. And if we have less, then there's some trade off, and it might work. It might or there might be some quality trade off, but but um, but one hour is kind of like plenty. Uh, but but basically the takeaway is better audio quality data, better audio quality data out, and that's all for me. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Garbage in, garbage out, right? Yeah, and it's also like I mean, if you have great data but recording conditions vary, like if you give us great data but from like twenty different sources, like two minutes each, that that could still still be like a problem even even if data is great because it's kind of really hard to make sense of all of it. So the, the, the best data is like when it comes from a single source and it is high quality, maybe two sources, but the more sources, the, the more challenging it is. Great, I think uh, any other questions, anyone? Because, uh... all right. Hey, I think we are, uh, we are about done. Thank you guys so much. This is a very uh, uh, disturbing and amazing uh, new technology that, uh, that in the best case scenario, kind of like our work as sound editors, that uh, uh, if you can tell what you just heard, then, then it didn't work. So, uh, so we're, we're gonna not be noticing your work for years to come in, in movies. Yeah, actually, one one project we work on right now will be credit in us. So hopefully we'll be able to share that stuff soon. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, I I send the link to this voice marketplace again to the chat. So we are looking for for beta testers. And that would be actually one one of the best way to try our system, because usually when you need to try our system, we need to train on particular voice pair. And that becomes like a proof of concept project. But in voice marketplace, you would be able to try it out and then get us uh, get, get any, any given any, any feedback you have to us. And also, we, we might help with some particular issues you, you might be having there. Amazing. All right. Uh, yeah. Alex, Grant, Dimitro, <clears throat> great stuff. Thank you so much for doing this for the motion picture sound editors. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's thanks, Mark. Di dynamic uh, uh, technology you're developing there. Very valuable. Thank you very much. That Jeremy Gordon is talking. <laughs> yeah, Jeremy is so the uh, treasurer us. of the motion picture sound editors. And uh, yeah, um, I guess th I'm sure that this is going to be growing, uh, you know, in leaps and bounds, we're going to be seeing, you know, amazing progress over the next several generations of your software. So it's going to get better and better. And it's already pretty cool. So 
I can't imagine what it's going to look like uh, in a few months or a year. Thank you again, guys. This was amazing. And uh, I look forward to talking to you guys again soon and, uh, and seeing all the, all the progress you guys keep making. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, everyone, for, for having us. Have a good one. Thank you. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.